Hello, everyone. Um, I, I want to start our panel discussion by saying that um, the most, what I find the most exciting part of uh, venture capitalist line of work is seeing the marvel of birth. When an idea turns into a business, sometimes a big and successful business, um, and it happens because of the vision, because of adaptability and perseverance of its founders. Some kind of magic is happening in startups, and the only people that are there to see it are the founders. And the only way to find out what actually happened is to talk to them. So this is what we're doing today. Um, I, I find a quick story particularly exciting um, because uh, that team successfully navigated through a very turbulent period. Um, Quick was born in 2006, which happened two years before Apple announced its iPhone, and with it brought the revolution that turned the mobile communication industry inside out, created massive opportunities to a lot of businesses, but also rendered some of the other businesses weak and, and irrelevant. Uh, next came the biggest financial crisis in decades, uh, which resulted in a huge economic downturn, which Sequoia Capital success, uh, uh, famously dubbed rest in peace good times, and yet we have a company that persevered that, and, and succeeded. Um, Quick was acquired by Skype in 2011, and as Anna said, the amazing technology that Quick developed even before smartphones came into our life are now part of the Skype uh, product that all of us use. So with that, I would like to pass the baton to Vijay and Bhaskar here and, uh, and ask them the first question, which is, what was the opportunity that you saw in 2006 and, and how quick uh, get started? Um, okay, I'll, I'll start. Can you all hear me? Um, you know, the way quick got started was uh, essentially myself and uh, my co-founder Ramu and Nikolai, the third co-founder, we were just bored at Oracle. Uh, we, we wanted to build something which could reach masses, mass consumers, and we realized that sitting at Oracle, we just couldn't do it. And we were all in real-time video space. Uh, so we were building unified communications at Oracle itself. So we, we left and we went to Ramu's garage, the three of us, and started looking at various ideas. And what we found was, you know, Skype was still there. Uh, they were doing video calling. They had started using video chat. But what we found was that these, whatever the products were, they just wouldn't work well in wireless networks, which is inherently unreliable. You know, you get into a pocket and they would constantly drop. So we figured out and built a technology which could make things work across wireless networks. And so we started with a desktop video conferencing product out to beat Skype. That's how we started in a garage. You mentioned mobile networks, and, and uh, I assume you mean cellular cellular networks. No, when we started, we were just looking at Wi-Fi, wireless okay. networks, or even people connecting their laptops with data cards, right? Because back in 2006, if you look at the smartphone market, it was nascent. You know, there was Nokia, Windows Mobile, and BlackBerry. Mm -hmm. BlackBerry didn't even have a camera at that point in time. So we were just looking at Nokia, Symbian-based devices, and Windows Mobile. Right. So it was a nascent smartphone market. So we were looking at desktop as the key way to get you know, people to communicate with each other through video. So Vijay, let me ask you um, the next question. There's, a, there's this three-person team working out of the garage, and, and you soon join first, as I understand, as an investor, as a seed investor, and then as a, as a CEO. What did you see in, in that, in that uh, small team, and what did you see in the opportunity? So you know, it's, um, it, it's all, it was all about the team. I knew uh, uh, Ramu for, from my high school days, and uh, I knew Bhaskar and Nick from Oracle days. I have a tremendous amount of respect for them. So when I met with them, I saw this like, really amazing video demo, right? But it was not the demo. It was, um, you know, all of them had these game faces on, sort of like when just before Peyton Manning goes out onto the field, like, you know, the, the look they have. It's the, that, that's the kind of look these folks had. And it, it was really a, a bet on the people. I felt that, uh, like most startups, where we'll end up, where they'll end up, is probably going to be very different from what the idea they were showing. It, the idea was impressive, don't get me wrong. It was, the quality was better than the Skype video chat at that time on the desktop. 
But what really got me on board was the people, and I think they were just dialed in, and I could see how serious they were, and I wanted to be part of that. Mm -hmm. You, fairly early on, the company made a pivot, and, and that pivot probably defined the ultimate success of the store. You pivoted towards a, a more mobile solution. What was the genesis of it, and how did that happen? So it goes back to, you know, the, the technology premise that we were building on that, that, you know, all these video calling or video chat products on desktop would fail on wire, wireless network. And the desktop video calling was becoming a complete red ocean, right? So there were just so many players coming in and trying to do video chat. So when we started looking at this, we said that, okay, what's the right use of the technology? Where is the blue ocean around this? And how can we take our company to that, uh, to that level? And mobile was it. Even though smartphone was nascent, we all strongly believed that one time smartphone will become the dominant thing. Uh, even though Nokia devices that we started with had a very small penetration in US, we realized that whether it be Nokia or someone else will come and disrupt that. And so we just moved towards mobile, which was a completely blue ocean at that point in time. There were carriers, some folks doing 3G video calling, but we took a completely different approach to it. And, um, and that's how we pivoted, saying that the technology is better used there. The problem is more acute on the mobile networks, you know, uh, because if you look at typical wireless network compared to mobile, mobile is inherently even more unreliable. So how can we make that even work there? And so we made that pivot, um, and it was a great pivot. What was unique about quick technology, and did, did you have any competitors at that time? Well, you know, uh, they, the key thing about the quick technology, even from early days, was uh, to get the most of the bandwidth that you have at any given moment. So, um, you know, even over public internet, uh, at any given, as you're doing a call, the amount of bandwidth that's available goes up and down, not a lot. On mobile networks, it goes up and down a lot. It drops off altogether at times. So the technology that Quick built that, uh, to adapt the uh, streaming to the available bandwidth, so you're sampling the bandwidth available about 10 times a second, you're adjusting it up and down, so to give you the best possible live transmission, but seamlessly kind of stitch the bits that you drop during the live transmission back after the fact so that um, users that are going to come in and look at the video after live don't get a replay of the live, but they get the full video. So this whole idea of adaptive streaming that is progressively stitched up together after the fact, um, that idea was so much more applicable to mobile networks. Obviously, they were very nascent. The 3G was just getting rolled out. Mm -hmm. Cameras were getting on the phones just then, a little bit on the high-end phones. Um, uh, and the compute power on the phones were, were still, uh, you know, was still you know, going up there. So uh, the, the question for us was whether we, can, um, uh, whether we can actually deliver a meaningful product, given the state of the industry at the time. We did a prototype uh, on a high-end Nokia phone, and we were just you know, blown away with what we could do. Mm. Um, and we felt like if we could do it at that, with that in 2007, you know, you, down the line, it was going to be on all phones and much better. So we, we just um, thought we'd be in a good place to kind of ride that, the, the, the technology convergence that was happening between 3G, camera phones, GPS, all these things that were getting on the phones. This was a very exciting time for the, for the mobile communications industry. You know, nascent 3G networks, um, still no Apple uh, visible on, on the horizon, although coming very soon. Nokia at the helm of a sort of smartphone revolution. Um, but those were the days before app stores came right. to our right. life. And yet you had, a, you had a program that worked on smartphones. In the days before apps, app stores, how did you go about distributing your product? Oh, that's a great question. So there are two components to it. One is building it out so that very easy, people who are experiencing this or we can, when we distribute this, they can easily download it and it comes straight to your phone. So we built out a mechanism whereby, you know, we can send a link to anyone, they can click that link and the application would automatically install on it. So that was one of the key parts that we solved in order to get through the distribution hurdle. The other thing, as we went into doing live streaming from the phone, a big part of our user base, I think um, around, I believe in our initial couple of hundred uh, users, 100 users were bloggers. And what they were doing is taking the camera phone 
and just broadcasting or looking at, you know, capturing everything, interviewing people and massively distributing to their entire audience. And so that helped us because any time they would distribute or do a video and people would watch that video, we would have a simple call to action saying that, hey, you want to do the same? Download the app. And so with one click, they would be able to get it on their phone themselves. So we created this entire distribution, which is all around content creation and being able to get people to just distribute massively. And that helped us get to you know, this kind of distribution and build that entire distribution ecosystem in order to get consumers coming in, downloading the app and experiencing the product. You know, I think uh, Robert Scoble was our 50th user. We're talking about bloggers. Right. And I think, uh, you know, he went to South by Southwest and uh, started live blogging the whole event. And I think it was just created a bit of a riot in the, you know, in that crowd that follows right. South by Southwest. And I think that just changed the trajectory. Uh, it's just, there were a lot of other bloggers, but there were some moments where it, 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 be, it definitely took an uptake. Um, and we were overwhelmed. I mean, we were, I don't think, ready internally to, to deal with the, with the volume that came through. So mm -hmm. um, it was... In fact, it was very that. interesting how the sequence of events happened. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was around December 17th when Scoble first somehow got... means we were doing a private alpha, but he somehow was able, you know, got the app on his phone and started broadcasting. And we were like, oh my God, we are not ready for this. Mm. So, but then we, late night, we got together and we said, what, did, what do we do? How can we ask him to just scale back, not do it because our servers are not ready yet? But then we internally discussed saying that, you know what? Maybe we just launched. Let's just go with it. So we ran, running to Fry's, all possible places, picked up hardware, Ramu was running around, putting it in data center. I was looking to figure out, you know, how we can get users to come in more, you know, how can we get the distribution built out? And it was those period of crunch time during this one week period where we went from just being something which someone was using on an alpha basis to actually where thousands and thousands of users were using it and viewing those videos. And interestingly, you know, that progression followed because after that, Scoble announced saying that I'm going to take it to CES first week of Jan. And we were like, okay, you know, we know what we need to do because we don't want the video quality to be poor. So let's make sure that we get to, at that point in time, 640 by 480, VGA quality, you know, before we hit CES. So that drove us to, in order to continuously push, push, push in order to get to that. And once CES happened, then it was World Economic Forum. So Scoble and others announced, hey, we are taking this to World Economic Forum. We said, okay, we know what we need to do in order to get to that before February. So there were all these sequence of events, which actually were great because it pushed us in order to get to that level of quality and that level of reliability so that all these great events can, you know, be broadcasted using Quick. Mm -hmm. Amazing. It's, uh, I guess it is much harder these days to get noticed if you have, a, if you have an app for an iPhone or, or a smartphone and uh, you get buried in the thousands of apps, you know, that are, that are in the App Store. Those were, those were different days. Let me uh, take a, 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 a sidetrack here and uh, when did you raise your first side, side fund, side, side money? When, when did you go to investors? When did you start talking to VCs? Uh, sure. At what point did, uh, did you decide to do that? So um, I think it was, um, we started in June 2006 and we closed our first angel round in which Vijay was, uh, was one of the participants um, in March. So the first six to nine months, you know, we were just tinkered, you know, in the sense, just focused on getting the product built out. And this was desktop video at that time. And once we had a prototype, that's when we, you know, showed to Vijay, showed to two other investors, and, um, and we raised around $900,000 mm -hmm. with three investors. Yeah, it was investors. interesting that, you know, after spending about 600000 of it, you know, we had this interesting meeting where I said, you know, this desktop stuff, you know, it's, it's great, but I don't know how we're going to, like, unseat Skype from this, right? So we're going to, like, go mobile. We don't know anything about it. And so it was an interesting call to make at that time, too. But we were all aligned. We felt that strategically that was a better fit. There were a lot of open questions. Um, and, you know, so, and we so, so, so did you get investor support at that time to, to do that yeah. pivot? Did, you, did it take much convincing? It, it actually didn't, uh, mainly because, you know, uh, of the three investors, the two investors were very, very engaged, right? For example, Vijay, even though he was an investor, he's a founder to me, right? Uh, 
so was uh, Kant, who means they're founders. They were actually with us. Mm -hmm. And as we were building things, you know, they were with us, guiding us, you know, providing us the wisdom and helping us through this process. So when we decided, or when we started figuring out, you know, okay, desktop is too crowded, it's how, how do we ma maneuver to a market segment, which is much more blue ocean, so that we can target that and, you know, really build our name around it, they were already on board with that. So it didn't take much convincing, it required more effort on our side to be able to, you know, do the proper due diligence before we move to that space. But I don't know, um, I, I didn't feel that, you know, it was a challenge trying to convince investors. And then you went on after you made the pivot and, and you made a couple more rounds of, of, of financing before um, over the next you know, couple of years or so. How did you go about choosing investors? What are the qualities that you're looking for when, when you talk to VCs? So you know, we went through a couple of you know, individual rounds of investment. So after mm -hmm. us, we did another round, a little bit larger round with you know, people like Mark Benioff, Mark Andreessen, and Ben Horowitz, and a few other people. Um, in, as individuals, it, not from their funds, it was not an institutional round. Mm -hmm. uh, that helped us um, you know, scale uh, the demand that we were seeing and, and grow. Um, so it was, uh, uh, and, and the way you know, the, we, we kind of, you know, th with those investors, it was really these folks have built some serious businesses. They understand um, uh, how, you know, uh, how to scale. They had good, you know, I, I think they had good advice, best practices. It was pretty easy to go with them, right? Um, we did two VC rounds. We ended up doing two VC rounds. The first one, it was really, uh, we did it at the um, uh, sort of the depth of the financial crisis. Like we had the impeccable timing of going to, mar going to raise our round in October 2008, about two weeks after the Shearson collapse. Mm -hmm. It took us you know, three sets of term sheets and eight months and, and a lot of pain to uh, get funded, and it was really... Um, you know, um, you know, uh, Quest uh, Venture Partners, Marcus is here, Marcus Fukawa, you know, he was brave enough to, you know, sort of go against the grain. Uh, a lot of the VC industry was pretty well shut down at that time. We were pre-revenue. We had a lot of momentum with users. We had partners like Nokia, but we were pre-revenue. Um, uh, so there, it was not like, what are the criteria for selecting? It was really, um, you know, who was brave enough and contrary mm -hmm. enough to come on board and, 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 and help us get there. And Marcus did that. Marcus and Quest did that for us at that time. And you know, so we closed that round in, in, uh, in 2009, in May, June 2009. Um, the, uh, about a, uh, so we had about 150,000 users at that time. So the, the second VC round we did, uh, which is when we, we met, uh, met uh, Almas, was uh, about a year later. And by that time, we had about five to six million users. We had a, a really great, we had a great year. Um, we had good traction with, you know, and, you know, with users. Uh, we had almost all the handset OEMs and many, many of the major carriers. You know, from a revenue point of view, we were very, getting pretty close to break even. Mm -hmm. So within about 12 to 14 months, I, I think our, uh, we came out of the financial crisis very much hardened and determined and super focused. So uh, you know, we, I think that was just a great year, year and a half of like, solid execution on all fronts. Uh, and we, when we got to, you know, we wanted to raise a fund to kind of accelerate that. Uh, that's, we had a number of VCs that were interested in it at that time. We had quite a number of people that were keen to participate in that round. Uh, there, I think for us, we looked, uh, the, the selection criteria came into play mm -hmm. that you're asking about. So the number one thing we felt was this whole mobile, uh, consumer mobile video space uh, is, is very dynamic. The technologies are changing, the, you know, the customer behaviors are changing. Um, it, it's, uh, the market is so dynamic that uh, the investors need to have the stomach to be able to ride up and down. It's going to be a roller coaster. We've been through the roller coaster. We needed to be, have people that were not looking for a very clear 12 month plan that, or 18 month plan that we're going to stick to, right? And we're going to check ourselves each month on what the, how we are progressing against the 12 month plan. But people that understood that there is just a lot of variability and, and we, we will need to be able to um, handle that. So that was the, uh, one criteria. And the second criteria were people around the board who can be smart and ask us really good questions and hold us accountable to, to what we were doing. Um, and they were intangibles, right? Uh, ultimately, you know, uh, we, we, we uh, went with Almas. I think one of, the, one of the big factors was two-thirds of our team was in Moscow. Almost all of our engineering was in Moscow. 
uh, it was a, one of our founders was based in Moscow. It was a very important part of who we were. And we loved um, Al Maz's uh, sort of focus on you know, Moscow and, and Silicon Valley and, and, and being able to bring those things together. Uh, we, we, so the, I think in, in the end, um, all of those factors and intangibles led us to working with Almaz, and we had just a terrific partnership. Excellent. Well, this is a, this is a good segue into the topic of, of running and having distributed teams, which is quite common these days as, as the hunt for talent uh, is, is, is getting, you know, even more, even, even more challenging, uh, especially if you're, if, if you're limited to by the geography. So you had a team in Moscow, you had a team here. What were the challenges that you were facing? What, what are the things that worked out? What are the things that didn't work out? Any advice to people who are building teams like that in their own companies these days? Yeah, so you know the challenges are something that I think anyone who has worked with distributed teams would know it's, it's just communication and being on the same page pretty much all the time, right? Because we could be seeing something differently. The Moscow team um, would be seeing something differently. But we just have to be aligned as to what we are building and how we go about that. So I think it just came down to just late night calls, early morning calls, working, working really hard, making sure that there's a good four hour overlap, four to six hour overlap with, between us. Um, that was one thing. Every six weeks, being in the great city of Moscow and Zelenograd, um, you know, so we made sure that we traveled back and forth. And, you know, it was, um, it's another thing which, which, which goes back to intangibles is, you know, we were really great friends, Nikolai and, and all of us. So when we would actually travel, we would never stay in hotels. We would stay in Nikolai's house. Uh, when Nikolai would travel, Nikolai, Alex, and the team would travel, they would actually come and stay with us. And a lot of times, you know, it was the week or two weeks when they would be here, we would be just telling our wife, saying that, okay, you know, take a vacation, right? Because the next couple of weeks, we are just going to be in the house and doing a whole bunch of stuff together. And um, in fact, a lot of interesting ideas came out from, I would say, from Nick's kitchen in Moscow. And so it, it is just constantly communicating, communicating over communicating, which I think helped us in the long run. Um, but you know, it is, um, it is one of those things where you know, we really felt that over communication was so much desired. Mm -hmm. and and just I to think, keep the team yeah. aligned. And the other part of it is having one of your founders be based in Moscow uh, and, you know, and who has got such a great reputation locally was, uh, was very helpful. So he built a, a very strong group of senior leaders out there um, that uh, even as we were going through a lot of difficult times here, you know, they were pretty well insulated in terms of um, uh, the work they needed to do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we kind of localized whatever actions we had to take to cut expenses and all that. We tried to localize that to Silicon Valley uh, because it's kind of hard to manage morale 6,000 miles away. So, uh, so, but you know, we had a great team that could just keep, keep marching ahead even as we were trying to figure things out here. So, so you think that- It was an advantage, you know, what I'm saying is it was actually, a, in that instance, it was an advantage to us that they were not here. Mm -hmm. um, just getting caught up in all the stuff that was going on in 2008 and 9. Right. So you think it's, it, it, it helped you that uh, one of the founders was actually in that geography where the team was? Absolutely. Was no a... doubt about it. Because we built that entire team around Nikolai. Mm -hmm. He was very well respected in the video space. Uh, and so he just put together teams and people who he had worked with before together. Mm -hmm. And you know, often, um, Jokingly, we used to call our Moscow office a doctor's office, <laughs> mainly because there were just so many PhDs, just working, cranking on this, mm. working out the best possible technology, the algorithms that's just going to build, this, build us towards this great success. So yeah, it, how, was, it was a huge advantage. How big did your team get? How many people did you have? So I think at the sides? time of the acquisition, we had about 60 people, about 40 to 45 were in Moscow, and the yeah. rest, rest were here. So all of the engineering team was in Moscow. Good. Well, um, after, um, after Quick became a success, um, no doubt it brought competition. How, how did you stay ahead of competition? So I think what? competition was interesting. It's, it's, there was not this, so we pivoted like uh, at least two times, you know, from desktop to mobile live video, mm -hmm. from mobile live video to, um, to really much more of a personal 
uh, and social video sharing, sort of like Instagram for video, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then we added you know, you know, two-way communications and all that. So the product changed quite a lot over the period, and the competition was very different. So there are companies that maybe you don't know now, but in those days, there's a company called Kite and a company called Flixwagon that were comp competitors in this live broadcasting space. So when we went into the social video sharing, companies like Ustream and Justin TV were you know, seen as alternatives, though they were focused on a more broadcast model and we were like, going towards more of a personal use case. Um, and when we added uh, video chat, uh, Skype and uh, Tango were probably seen as the biggest competitors. So the competitive landscape kept changing. We were really not focused on that. We were focused on what, the, what we were hearing from the users on you know, what's going to be compelling to them. How, how did the dialogue with Skype begin? How did you get on, on, on the company's radar screen? And, and, and sort of what, what prompted the, the, the right. what ignited the discussion initially? Yeah. So I, I think the initial discussion was very much uh, around partnership. Uh, as we went into the details, as they looked at what we were doing and our roadmap and we looked at what they were looking at, uh, our, uh, our ambitions were, were the same. They were coming from a video chat and they wanted to become more like us. And, um, we, and we, want, we, we coveted the community they have, like 800 million users. So it became pretty clear that it was either going to be, we we're going to be very aligned together or we we're going to compete. So um, it, there wasn't a lot of middle ground in terms of a partnership. Uh, it, it, but it started out as a, as a partnership discussion. What kind of partnership would that, would that conceivably be? Were you thinking you know, it technology would have been, or? Uh... It, it, it would have been a technology partnership. Uh, so they, their vision was to, um, Skype always was very strong with um, you know, video chat in the video. Mm -hmm. um, they've had that since 2005. Uh, they have not really done much in the social video communications area. Um, so that requires asynchronous video messaging, asynchronous video communications technology that we were strong in. So it would have been a technology partnership where they would take it, uh, our asynchronous video communications technology, add that to Skype uh, product, and, and essentially the Skype product would look like the quick product with video chat, video sharing, mm -hmm. live communications, and all of that. Uh, that was the, uh, the, uh, the, the partnership would have been a technology partnership. And, uh, and, and from, from that stage, how did it progress into the acquisition talk? Was that fast? Did it happen over time? What, what, what was the sequence? There? Well, I think there was, we, we had a discussion and there was two months of silence, which we were, you know, we were, you know, we, 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 we were, there were a lot of things going on uh, for us at that time. We had this fantastic rollouts with, you know, Sprint and T-Mobile and Verizon. We were on national TV, like, you know, the Giants were playing baseball game. Every third ad was this quick ad, like from end to end from sky. So we were like a lot of, you know, we, we, had, we were experiencing tremendous growth. Uh, so we kind of forgot about it. Uh, and two weeks before, but actually a week before Christmas, uh, they contacted us saying they would like to, you know, Tony Page, the CEO at the time, wanted to meet and, and talk about, uh, you know, options. And that's how it started. Uh, you know, then it was clear that there were, um, you know, going, leaving the meeting a couple of months earlier, we felt that it was either, I mean, it was really not much of a partnership opportunity, you know, because of, you know, it, it, doing a technology partnership is enabling a big competitor with all of our capabilities. Uh, it, that doesn't make sense, right? right? So, um, so we, uh, we were not surprised that if they did come back with, we were expecting that to be more of an acquisition discussion. So what, what do you think actually turn them on in the sense that from, from sort of the, the initial discussions, the technology partnership, what made them make the move eventually? So what, I think there's, it, were they, are, were there they two seeing parts you as a competitor at that time? Or? Yeah, so there's a couple of things going on and, and I'll let Bhaskar add to that. There's, they were on the product side, uh, their ambitions to sort of transform Skype from like a video chat application to something that was much more mm -hmm. uh, social and engaging. Uh, that it fit exactly with what we had. So there was a good product fit. Uh, in, back in the year before the acquisition, we pretty much won all the major handset uh, video uh, communications deals, you know, with Nokia, Motorola, S Samsung, LG, you know, pretty much everybody out there. 
and also with all the major carriers. You know, which started with Sprint and T-Mobile, it went to, you know, AT&T, uh, Verizon, and Docomo, and all these other guys. So uh, we were winning pretty much all the major deals in the uh, in the handset and the carrier space, uh, and that's something that. And a lot of times, Skype was the competition there. Um, and I think so. They loved the traction that we were having with with partners, and I think uh, I think that was there was both a product driver and a, I think partnership and a BD kind of a driver to the deal. Was Skype on on mobile at that time? Did they have? A oh mobile yes, solution? they had a very popular. I mean, the Skype, uh, the, the iPhone and Android apps were out, mm -hmm. uh, and you know they were pretty heavily used. Um, so yeah, they had they had a. Sorry. Yeah, but one of the other things that they saw from a tech standpoint is, you know, Skype inherently um, at that point in time was a full peer-to-peer -peer technology, right, right, as to how it works. And that premise doesn't really work on mobile, right, because you're constantly hitting the battery and the radio network, right, peer-to-peer. Yeah. -peer, you're pinging all your peers all that time. So they realized that, you know, any, and at that point in time, anyone using the Skype uh, apps on their phone, their battery would die instantly. Right, or, or in a short period of time. So they realized that you know, they needed to make a technology shift, which is more towards mobile. Mm -hmm. And we were mobile only. Right? We didn't but, have a desktop yeah. product. We were built around the fact that how can we conserve battery life? How can we make sure that we are utilizing CPU correctly? So there was another fit whereby even they had the mobile products, they realized that you know, this was the right architecture, this was the right way to build it out. And that uh, was another you no, know, that was advantage a, that's a that they key saw. Point. I think they, you know, so we talked about asynchronous, they had synchronous peer-to-peer, -peer, we had asynchronous technology, but also we had video chat, which was synchronous stuff, which was server-assisted. So augmenting their peer-to-peer -peer architecture with you know, more server-assisted uh, communications, both even for real-time communications, I, I, you know, they, they, they needed to go in this direction to become a bigger player in mobile. And that's, you know, post-acquisition, that's really been the focus of um, the uh, technology integration. From for, for a smaller company, having, having an acquirer around can be a very distracting process. Um, sometimes the deal just falls yes. through, right. uh, and yet it takes a lot of, a lot of yeah. time away from, from running the business. Right. Um, how long did the did this process last until not, you were not very long? Them? You know, I mean, I, you know, we've done other startups before, and we're totally aware of the distraction. Not just when it happens, but if you actually start thinking about acquisitions even before it happens, as yeah. I've seen with a lot of companies, it's um, uh, so we we had a couple of other acquisition offers, um, not formal term sheets, but offers from uh, two other companies in the year before Skype, year, year and a half before Skype. Came were, they, were they solicited or did no? They they just they, they, they approached us. Okay. Right, They're, they were both you know players in the valley. Mm -hmm. We you know so we made a very quick determination within within the day. We just consulted with our board and made a very quick determination that it didn't make sense and moved on. Um, and when Skype happened, about a, you know it's a week sort of it was you know was, uh, just a week before Christmas. Um, we both um, wanted to get this done quickly. Everybody wants that. But we set a target for Consumer Electronics Show, which was June 5th of the, you know, 2011, and said, look, we, we, we want to get this done in this time frame. We don't have time to have this drag on. So we had set some pretty hard limits. So Skype and Silver Lake, which was running the process for Skype, and us worked through Christmas and New Year and just got there just the night before uh, CES. Mm -hmm. We were very hard set and determined about the timeline. Uh, there was so much else going on for us that we uh, couldn't afford to have this thing drag on. And, and uh, so during those three weeks, we were open and totally, um, you know, what, we supported them ev with everything they wanted, but we just needed that to march along. And, uh, and uh, to, to their credit and our team, I think we, we everybody worked through the holidays and got there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think acquisitions can be a distraction. You know, people start thinking about acquisitions too soon, and when they come up, it just totally, I've seen it sort of take people's eyes off the ball. Right. Uh, so this was, and we were not really looking to be acquired. You know, so when, when this came up, we agreed that it made sense strategically, but if we do it quickly. Well, mo most exits uh, for venture capitalists uh, these days in, in technology happen through strategic acquisitions. 
So it's, it's, it's a common situation uh, for a lot of startups to eventually find themselves in discussion with a, with a buyer or, or multiple buyers. Mm -hmm. um, Skype was your third, uh, uh, Quick was your third uh, startup at that time and, and you had previous exits. What would be your advice to uh, entrepreneurs in the audience who find themselves either, you know, under the, under the microscope of an acquirer? What, what are the do's and what are the don'ts if, if you have an acquirer? So I think the, the first thing is that I, I think you, as, a, as, a, as a small team, uh, you've got to be completely focused on the product, your customer, and the business model, and, and making that real. Anything else is a distraction. Um, I, I think it's, uh, that's where the value comes from. Uh, you know, I've been in the last couple of years involved with a number of companies. I've seen in, ca in cases where when there's an acquisition interest tax risk, it just disrupts the whole team. Um, so my re recommendation would be to um, just not really think about acquisitions, worry about acquisitions. Now, this advice doesn't hold for certain types of entrepreneurs. There are people that have sold two companies to Cisco already, and they're doing a third company in some networking technology that they feel could be, they're building it for acquisition by somebody. So those, so there's not, not a single rule, So there, but for most entrepreneurs, uh, you're not building for acquisition, you're building a real business, and if acquisition interests come, um, you deal with it very quickly, uh, and, and then move on either way, mm -hmm. right? Uh, not, not get distracted by it um, uh, you know, before, during, or, or after, yeah. And, then, and you know, just to add to that, the other thing that, um, as Vijay was talking, came to mind is another thing that helped in our case was our engineering was in Moscow, and product development and moving that forward was, was all over there happening in Zelenograd. So we still kept that cadence whereby we were just not distracted on the product yeah. side. So as acquisition talks would happen, whatever was happening, it's not that we took a pause and all of a sudden we are thinking as to what we do. We said that, no, we are out to do this. And we kept building our product based on what we are seeing, the market evolve and how users were using it. And even through this entire three week period of Skype, we just didn't take a pause. We were just constantly delivering during that period of time. Um, so I think that helped quite a bit, right? Because there, were, there was this entire team of engineers who were just cranking even though there was acquisition talks happening in, in the Silicon Valley. I mean, we did a major product release on, I, you know, on iPhone a week exactly. after the acquisition. You know, it, didn't, it didn't slow us down. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's an interesting topic, too. The fact that you had a distributed team and a large part of your organization was actually not here, not, not even in the same country as, as they acquire, was that ever a factor? Was that ever something that they, you know, considered or doubted? Um, you they, the no, the, I think they, they actually liked it, mainly because if you look at Skype's origin, they are in Estonia. Mm -hmm. They are an Eastern European company. Right. And the fact that we had such a big team in Russia, which is like a couple of hours from Estonia, mm -hmm. was a positive. Skype also has a number of offices in Europe, all over, right? If you look at Stockholm, Prague, all these places, easily accessible from, from Russia. So they saw this as a big positive, that a big part of engineering is in Russia. And when the... When the this Skype and Silver Lake team went to our offices and met the team there, I they were just blown away by, uh, by the depth. I, I think it's very hard to assemble a team of that caliber in the, in the valley uh, for, a, for a company our size. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think when you have that, this kind of a accelerated due diligence, there's some things that stick out. And for them, the thing that stuck out, stuck out for them was, was the depth and the strength of the team we had. So, um, you know, it, 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 I think in that instance, it was a, definitely a positive. And uh, did you join Skype after the acquisition? Did you spend time with them? Yeah, I was there for about eight or nine months to mm -hmm. lead the transition and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and then you know, and left. Yeah. So, so what was the life after, after that? What, what life after, after Skype? A life after Skype. <laughs> what? <laughs> Took a lot of vacations. <laughs> Uh, spend a lot of time with family, getting to know my kids again. I'd forgotten, <laughs> or they had forgotten me. Uh, so there were all these things that, that we did. Uh, but then, you know, it was, uh, we were just joking about it. After a few months, you know, the, the, you just start itching to go back to work. And, uh, and so after Skype, you know, I joined the startup called Playphone that I'm at now. Uh, leading products there. And we are doing something very interesting on the mobile gaming space, building out a platform. Um, so yeah, so 
after a few months just had yeah. to get back and start I, I, working I could, in a small uh, company. I was able to hold on a bit longer. So whenever <laughs> I had this urge, you know, uh, to like, um, I was working with a number of startups, but it didn't feel like, um, you know, at the end of the day, it didn't, didn't accomplish much. So whenever I felt that urge, I went for a long bike ride and let the urge pass. It held, that held up for like a year. I was, I was really took a couple of years off. Um, and then um, uh, a, f a few months ago, uh, late, late last fall, I you know, got together with some really great people I'd worked with in the past. And uh, I've been working on a new project. And uh, we we're excited about you know, a company called Workato. Mm -hmm. A lot has changed in the, in the mobile apps world. Mm -hmm. It got crowded. Uh, the whole ecosystems got disrupted. Carriers are no longer a major force in the economics of it. Some call them dumb pipes. We've seen some amazing deals in the, in the messaging world, um, some huge valuations and acquisitions. What are your thoughts on, on the sector? Is there anything left to do? What, what a... <laughs> you know, when we started Quick, we, we thought that messaging was done already, right, at that point in time. Uh, so that's why we went video. But what has happened is with all the proliferation of smartphone messaging is, I believe there are still a lot of opportunities there. You can see today, even today, even the likes of WhatsApp and others who provide the basic messaging capabilities, there are contextual communications, right? That are focused on certain types of communication, the likes of whether it be secret, whether it be anonymous communication. There are just different variations as to how people want to communicate with their friends, with their close family, with their kids. And, and I still think there is a whole bunch of innovation to be done there as to how to really focus in those areas and build out a product that, that suits a very specific segment. Yeah, no, I think there's, a, there's definitely, I, I do feel there's a lot of opportunity left. I mean, just, you know, some of the companies, you know, I've been involved with and I'm excited about, there's, you know, people, um, uh, you know, working on this, some contextual communication networks like high school kind of networks. There is uh, anticipatory computing and communications um, around getting context for you and you know helping you be smarter in your communications, and and there is uh, you know uh, uh, you know moderated you know kind of things and and com safe communications for kids. Uh, I see some really really interesting ideas that uh, you know problems that uh, that haven't been solved or opportunities that are there right now that um, I, I think we're just seeing. Um, I think the start of that. Mm -hmm. uh, like Bhaskar said, uh, back in 2008, you know, we thought this whole messaging and networking was played out. Facebook and you know, all these guys have already done it, and there's no need to like, worry about that. But we were, you know, obviously, we were wrong. <laughs>